deluded i'm back again i've got my good mate dan here you know he was you know i thought black man timing was something special he's managed to be later than me so yeah shout out to dan he's made it happen anyways man i know he's good for it again if you're locked in make sure you're smashing the like button make sure you're following rants to see him in the chat and make sure you're following dan potts man he's been making some great content not just arsenal content but been in and around with all the other football football content creators i also enjoy the cut up clips you do when you kind of guide the conversation and make man lose their heads and whatnot man but how you doing my bro man yeah um listen man i'm really good man it's a good time at the moment for us and we've picked up some form which i'm sure we'll get into apologies for being late my bro i had some technical problems but i'm here now man so uh good to be on with you again my brother come on my guy you said it there yeah and i, I the first thing i want to ask you is has there been a change in Arsenal since Dubai? And what have you seen? And why has it been like we had terrible form in December? We've obviously started January well. We've taken 12 points from 12. We go to Burnley tomorrow with full of confidence. Like, yeah, man. Like, how are you feeling about that? Yeah, definitely changes, man. Definitely changes since Dubai. I think set pieces, DJ, are the biggest for me, man. Like, honestly, set pieces were always all right with us in terms of us scoring from them. But actually... I would say the lead up from probably the back of November through to Christmas, they were really poor with Trossard and Martinelli on them. I don't know if it was just the fact that they just couldn't get their set pieces right or we were trying sank that weren't working because they were all hitting the first man. They weren't beating the first defender. It weren't poor. consistent either. <laughs> Very inconsistent, bro. And I think the changes of Declan Rice on there, nobody wanted to put him on there. It's like when, you know, Harry Kane took the corners for England and everyone was like, what the hell's going on here? Do you know what I'm saying? He's six foot three. He should be in the box. He should be in the mixer, yeah. Yeah, his technique's been class, man. I'm a massive fan of him as a footballer. And I think what he's managed to do is actually put some of those deliveries in. And we've scored from a man. Palace, we saw the other day against West Ham. And he's been phenomenal yet again. That's definitely been an improvement. And I think the other thing that's improved is our style of play, bro. We're a lot more free-flowing. We've been allowed to express ourselves a lot more. There's been more tenacity and flair from a couple of players. Saka and Martinelli have definitely improved because of that. And I think Martin Erdegaard's been allowed to get into the game more. And it's no coincidence to me that when Gabriel Saliba and Rice at the start of this season were our best, player, um, our best uh, players, it was because we were playing that controlled football or that possession-based, um, very defensive-minded. But now... We're a lot more free-flowing. Saka comes into the mix. Erdegaard comes into the mix. Trossard deserves a mention. Obviously, uh, Martinelli has picked up a little bit more of his form and started to score a couple of goals again. So, yeah, bro, I'm really uh, I'm really uh, enjoying watching it at the moment, man. These last four games since Dubai have, have been good, man, I must say. I agree with you in that it feels for me that we've gone back to basics. It feels like we've taken the shackles off slightly and been a bit, you know, married, got back to basics defensively and just su suddenly a light bulb's clicked in our heads. It's like, we've actually got some decent attackers. Let's start playing some football and doing what we need to do. With that being said, though, I do think there isn't too much difference with how we are now. Obviously, the results and how we've been generally this season. Do you think, like, more than tactics or players' form and stuff, do you think a lot of our issues were psychological, especially in front of goal? Because we won 6-0 against West Ham and we absolutely cooked them. But there were some chances where we could have made it probably a cricket score. But it's like we kept going. And you look at the FA Cup game against Liverpool, you know, we looked down in the dumps whenever an opportunity was missed and it looked like it was really affecting us. Some of it has been definitely psychological. But what I will say is this, Jesus has been out for a few games. 
And I don't, I like Jesus a lot, man. This isn't me. Big up to Roms, by the way, in the chat. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Big up Roms, man. I don't feel like it is just psychological because Jesus missed out the last couple of games and Trossard and Havertz come into the mix. And actually, in every game, it was kind of different. Like, we absolutely dominated in majority of the last four games. But the Palace game, it was not free-flowing, uh, open-play football. We got the goal in the end from the Trossard goal, but the others were um, were set pieces. Against Nottingham Forest, I thought we, were, we dominated and dominated, but it wasn't like we were peppering their goal at times, particularly in the first half, I thought we struggled. Um, and then when the Liverpool game onwards, we really did turn it on, man. And I thought we were dominant, free-flowing. I thought we actually could have definitely won by more goals. And actually, do you know what? The FA Cup game we played against Liverpool, they weren't too dissimilar, apart from we finished our chances in that one. Against West Ham, it was just demolition, man. It was it was set pieces. It was free-flowing. It was taking it round them. Arteta was even taking the piss, bruv, in the end. You know, flinging on Cedric and Elneny and a 16-year-old boy. Like, it was, it, they were dusty, man. So, yeah, I've been really impressed, bro. And I think, although some of it's psychological, I think some of it is um, a little bit of change up in some of our tactics because we've been a lot more attack-minded, in my opinion. Um, even after the games against West Ham, we were missing our chances. I still didn't look at it and think that, you know, it was the same Arsenal that I'm seeing now. This is definitely mm. Arsenal. And I think the Dubai break's done as well, bro. What do you make of, obviously, when you win 6-0 in any game, keeping a clean sheet, sharing the goals, you know, Declan Rice obviously coming back to haunt his team and putting in a performance against his former club that we like. You know, many people expected us to probably lose to Liverpool. And if we were to beat Liverpool, which we did, obviously, you know, probably shank ourselves against West Ham. Do you think the last two victories are a bit of a statement for Arsenal that we're still in and around the title challenge or whatever? Yeah, I think what they've done is they've proven a lot of neutral fans wrong. And I said this, man, we rattled a load of fan bases by beating Liverpool. Now, let's be real. Liverpool are an unbelievably good side. But it's not like we've just beaten Liverpool and that's it now. The title's done. But it, it's like that. Like the reaction from some of the media and some of the fan base. I'm like, hang on a minute. I still, yeah, man. I'm like, I still don't even think we're going to win this league. But maybe everyone else now thinks we will. The reaction was bizarre, man. I've never seen anything like it. Like, put that camera down. Get down the tunnel. Calm down. You ain't won shit yet. And I'm like, imagine if we'd have lost 3-1 deluded, right? What would have happened then? It would have been exactly. that pile on Arsenal. They've thrown away a title race in That's... February. You can't win, man. Now, don't get me wrong. There are some fans that go way over the top, right? And I like to think that you, I, and a few more are not th those people. But there is a lot of them that do. So I understand why that bunch and that section That's... get on other fans' tits, right? That's just the way it is. But don't come for the club and say that this is just calm down. They're still immature, emotional celebrations, emotional response. We have just beaten a very good team who are still top of the league, as I can see things right now. We've beaten them 3-1. Let's just let us celebrate how we want. We move on to the next game. Then what happens? Oh, Arsenal did might miss this up against West Ham now, and it will ruin all of the great celebration against Liverpool. They could mess this up. We know what this Arsenal team are like. 6-0, delivers. Declan Rice bangs it in. They all go home at half-time. We're 4-0 up. And they're all going home to get a gun shop around Westfield. Oh, that's not what we wanted. That's not what the media wanted. This isn't happening. This is. And I'm thinking, why are you all so like worried about what Arsenal are doing all of a sudden? Like we still fate right now. People were first third. There's no difference. This just now means that we ain't out of a title race and we still are hanging around a bit longer. And let's hope we're there till May. Right. This that's doesn't actually change anything for me. So I don't know, but a lot of people are getting absolutely rattled, man. They're losing their minds. It's bizarre, bro. Bro, it's bizarre. And it's because like, I think against West Ham and Liverpool, you know, the media had their pre, you know, they already they already had their um, you know, they already had their statements and all the talking points and all the potential talking points. And all, we probably would have kept the lights on at Sky Sports for another year had we have collapsed in these last two games. By all means, ask questions of Arsenal when we fail, when we do things wrong, whether we can win a title, have all of these questions. But when we do well, I'm not saying to start you know singing to, to the rooftops and saying we're going to do this and that but give credit as you said you know Liverpool are a great team they've been up and up up there with City anyone that beats them it's going to be amazing I remember Klopp against West Brom or something he's leading them out to do cheers you know Spurs won the league in September they're bringing their kids onto the pitch nothing is said nothing's actually said about Mikel Arteta winning 6-0 and not really looking too animated with his celebrations Liverpool's a game 
they're the games that make the Premier League. Liverpool versus Arsenal is one of the highest scoring fixtures. Obviously, the connotations of historically what it means in this season. There's going to be passion. And for years, this football club during the Emirates era, we were told we lack passion, we lack fight, we lack desire. So why can't we? And I, you know, fans, as you said, there are some special fans that move crazy and do crazy things. But whether you rate anybody at Arsenal, I don't think Mikel Arteta and them players got too excited. I think they would have enjoyed the night against Liverpool and then the work starts the following day towards West Ham and now it's a, it's a case of Burnley. So where where are you at with Arsenal winning the league title then? like, do, do you have more faith in such? I agree with you in that we're probably the third best team. We probably need a lot of variables to fall, that are out of our control to fall into place, that like you need Liverpool and City to lose. I don't think we can afford to drop any points going into the City game, which mm. I think is quite unlikely, but are you more confident about a title kept ch challenge? Like, has it done anything? I'm more confident that we're going to be in the title race because I felt like we were dropping off towards a top four race at one stage. Now, it is yeah. too early, to be honest, to believe to be in a title or a top four race. Even now, some people think it's too early before you start to understand what a title race looks like. But I will say this. I think we'll be there till the end. Now, with Liverpool and Man City, I think it will be free of us right to the end. Um and I think what it's done is it's given us a little bit of confidence for two things. One, what we've just said, our improvements after Dubai. But two, our players that are coming back. Because we've actually got some players people have forgotten about completely. Players like Party, Timba, Fabi Vieira, Tommy Yasu, Smith Rowe, uh, Zinchenko and Gabriel J Jesus, the two players that have, met, have missed out on the last couple. Jorginho was on the bench, but is now fully fit. So if we can start getting them players back, then we have a great chance of actually going quite far in both competitions because we've got the squad that's there. You know, people will look at Tommy Asu and Timber and go, well, they don't really get in the first team. Actually, I beg to differ. I actually think Timber could get in the first team from the, what I've seen of him in pre-season. I think he could get ahead of Zinchenko. I think if there was any knock in defence, Tommy Asu's there and his very good cover. I think Thomas Party, everybody knows what we're better, what we're like in midfield transition-wise when he's in the team. So definitely those players are going to improve Arsenal Football Club in terms right. of our squad depth, right? So that definitely gives us a little bit of confidence. And I think as well, what I will say, like I look at Manchester City in the last few games, right? Everybody says, oh, Arsenal, calm down. They've beaten West Ham, who are on their knees. Beaten Palace, who are absolutely dreadful. You've beaten Forest, that are, are dreadful. Now you've got Burnley. Man City is still too good. Well, let's just look at the last few results that Man City have won, right? They've beaten Everton. They've beaten Sheffield United. They've beaten Huddersfield in the FA Cup. They've beaten Newcastle, who, let's be real, they've been depleted. They've beaten Burnley. They've beaten Brentford. And they've beaten Everton again. But no one's saying, oh, Man City, calm down. It's, they, they should be beating them games. It's like, Man City haven't lost. This is unbelievable, this run. When we go and do it, and we go beat West Ham Palace, and we beat, let's say, we beat Burnley tomorrow, we beat Nottingham Forest, it's like, calm down. I only beat Forest and Palace and West Ham. Well, hang on a minute. Like, <laughs> Man City works both ways, right? But Why do you think, think that is then? It's because of Man City, bro. They've they've proven Man City. It doesn't matter who you put in front of Man City, they can beat whoever they want, and they'll it will look amazing. Oh my god, how are they doing this again? When Arsenal do it, it's like calm down. It will it will fall off soon. Now they probably got a right to say that because we go in a cluster of results and we start to lose games like we did to West Ham, Fulham, and let's hope it don't happen again. But if it does, you guarantee we'll lose a couple in a row, right? Because that's what happens with Arsenal. We don't lose one game and then bounce back. We always go and have a couple of bad yeah. results, whether it be a draw and a loss or whatever. But Man City don't do that. But you still got to look at it and think, actually, Man City, before that, they dropped points to Palace. They dropped points to Wolves. They've lost games. Ever said they fell off at the start of the season. Precisely. So I don't know that we can sit there and always be like that anymore. But Man City have been evident. It's been evident that Man City over the last three, four seasons, they do well around this time of the year, man. So that's why we're going to have to hold that. But listen, Arsenal at the moment, Nobody wants to admit it, but Arsenal have improved in the last few games. Arsenal fans can see it. Some of the neutral fans that actually have their head screwed on can see it. Does it mean we're going to go win a league? Probably not. But it does mean that we're going to be in the mix. And people don't like that, man. They wanted us down with Villa and Newcastle and Spurs and Man United. Of course they did. They wanted to laugh at Arsenal. I'd be the same if it was Man City and Liverpool. The game's yeah? the game, yeah. Yeah, the game's the game. But I look at it and I feel like there's been a lot of overreaction from some of the neutral fan bases that are throwing their toys out the pram when actually nothing's changed. Arsenal have just gone from third to third, but now they're just less points away from Liverpool and City. Like, calm down, man. It's really not that deep. <laughs> I think I think you're bang on the money. I think, you know, last the two seasons before, obviously, towards the tail end of the season, that's where we shanked it. 
this season, I think we're going to look back at Jan in December in the December period and say that's where we showed our naiveties. I think at best, all we can do is just try and put points on the board and hope that Liverpool and these clubs drop points. But I think we'll fall short. So, how do you feel about the Champions League then? Because I know we're you know we've got to go through Burnley and whatnot, but you know we've got Porto. Bayern Munich don't look the best. You know, people, PSG and Mbappe's leaving, could that harm them? I don't think we can win the champs, but how do you view the Champions League? So overall, the Champions League um, is probably a good year to be in it. Now I've said that, we'll probably go out to Porto. But when That's when I look at it on paper, and I know football isn't played on paper, but when you look at it like that, I think there's Manchester City who I fear the most. I always will fear Real Madrid because they are Real Madrid. <laughs> um, I've looked at Bayern Munich, deluded. I don't think they look that great, bruv. I honestly don't. Last I think two games, they've been terrible. Really bad, man. Like Bayern Leverkusen schooled them and Lazio deserved to win. I watched the game. I thought Lazio were the better team. I didn't think Champions League wise, Bayern Munich looked anything. And, and I'm honest with you, bro. They played against Man United and I thought they looked bad. So I've not been really impressed with it. And although Harry Kane is absolutely smashing it over there in terms of records and goals, he might walk away trophyless in his first year. And that is scary. That would be something. You know, Spurs, that is ridiculous, man. Now they've got to start looking at him then, not their actual like situation at Spurs. However, um, Inter Milan are scary. Their defence is That's, very, very good. the final last year. Bro, I think Simeone Exaghi has done very, very well with them. And um, they're flying in Syria. They're very good defensively. They've got a good balance in their side from what I can see. And they've got some players that can really hurt you, man, up top. So I think them are a team that I would look at and take seriously. Um, but other than that, bro, I honestly believe Arsenal should be disappointed if they lose to any of the other sides over two legs because you can't go out to Porto, in my opinion. I think we're better than Barcelona across two legs. I think we're better than Napoli if they get through Barcelona over two legs. I think we can do PSG over two legs. I don't think I don't be scared by them. I'm scared by Mbappe, but I'm not scared by the team. They haven't got a team there that scares me. So really, Real Madrid and Man City are the main two. And I'd put Inter Milan probably just ahead of Bayern Munich at the moment. But other than that, a lot of people are suggesting that Arsenal might be the best team right now suited to beat Man City and get past them in the Champions League. My problem is, where are we going to draw each other? Are Man City and Real Madrid going to draw each other in the quarters or a, or a semis? We don't have a clue, man. So it could be really interesting to see what happens in the draw. But we've got to get through Porto um, first. I feel the home and the away leg are going to be very different in this game, bruv, against Porto. I don't fancy us to go over to Porto and comfortably win at all. I really don't. We haven't won there, in fact. Um, Look at last year when we played away from home in the European knockout stages against the Portuguese side. And in fact, if there's one major criticism I have of Mikel Arteta, I feel we collectively we've pissed about in Europe, if I'm quite honest with you. Yeah, we have. Yeah, we have. And I think my only kind of stance with that is we were messing around with the Europa League competition, which he never should have done. We were playing B players. We had our team of Eddies and Nelsons and Fabi Vieiras and Smith Rose and players like that. Now we can't do that. You do that against Porto, they will beat you You're three finished. or four nil. You're finished. Yeah. So and that, I mean that on a on an aggregate score. Excuse me. I think we'll go over to Porto and struggle. I don't think we'll lose, but I um, wouldn't be surprised if we draw that game. I really wouldn't be surprised if we draw that game. But then I do think we'll beat them at home, and that's uh, that. That's what's got to. We, we've got to be comfortable, and I don't think this is going to be a comfortable victory. But I do think Arsenal will scrape through it, man. But uh, I don't know what your thoughts are on Champions League because a lot of people speak to me. They say I think we've got more chance of winning this than the Premier League. I maybe I agree with that, but because the Premier League is unbelievably consistent in terms of Man City, but a Champions League is no easy competition to win, bro. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't, I don't know, Dan, you know, it's a, weird, it's a weird one because there are many times I sit there and I think it feels like Arsenal are more suited to being a cup team, like play on the day, get it done. But then I look at it in the Premier League, you know, you've not got much margin for error against Liverpool and City, but mathematically in terms of points, you do. But I think as much as Liverpool are good and City are good and all the teams in Europe, we have this element of not playing to our maximum in certain regards or certain naiveties. Like you look at our barren run of form or, you know, I'm being very harsh because I think everyone ex expected to concede against Liverpool. But, you know, I think the team that I want us to be, we don't concede in that Liverpool game. We don't concede in the Nottingham Forest game. When we get to that, like, it's like we're here. When we get to here, I'll be the most confident Arsenal fan in the world, but it's almost like what Arsenal turn up. And I agree with you, especially about going away from home. I think if we go away from home and we get something, I think the Emirates has looked buzzing, at not as much as last season, but it's looked buzzing where Champions League is concerned. There was great atmosphere against Liverpool. You was there, so you could probably aid that more than I can. And it's them kind of things. But I just feel we show our naiveties at sometimes in the Premier League and they're even more highlighted in the Champs. 
I think we're more personally, I don't think we win either, but I'd be more hopeful of the Premier League if the footballing gods do something. I'd rather win the champs because we ain't got that. Like, where, where would you go with it? Do you think there's more chance of the Prem or the champs? I think there's more chance of the, of the uh, Champions League, bro. Um, and it's hard because the way you answer it can go both ways. Exactly. So I answer it because it's a knockout, but that's the reason why it's it harder to win because you get knocked out. So it's really hard. <laughs> I think where I'm at is the consistency of the Premier League has been, you have to be flawless really at the back end of the season. I don't think Arsenal are going to be. So I feel like we've got more chance of beating a team like Real Madrid or Man City in a one-off game than I have in trying to compete with them across a 15, 16 game period against each other, against all the other teams. And that's the only reason I've said Champions League. And I suppose the evidence to back that up for me isn't just how we're playing and form because that goes out the window in Champions League. It's actually for the teams that have won it in the past have not always won the Premier League. So yeah. in 2004, when we were the best team around or one-off, Porto won it. They weren't one of the best teams around. A year later, Liverpool won it and they come fifth or sixth in the Premier League. In 2012, Chelsea come eighth and won the Champions League. Um, I've seen teams before win it and you think, wow, I didn't expect that. I had that no no time. Now, obviously not every year is going to be a Real Madrid or a Bayern Munich or PSG. But at the same time, normally you look at the form in their league and go, wow, you can see why. Like we've just seen. You can see why Man City are European champions, domestic champions and domestic cup champions because they're an unbelievable side. But it hasn't always been like that. And I think sometimes you look at what Arsenal are right now and I don't think we are the best team in England. I don't think we are the best team in Europe. And crazy as it sounds, that's why I think we've probably got a little bit of a sneaky chance of potentially doing well in the Champions League because history suggests that you don't have to be the best team in the league to win it. So it's crazy. I still don't think we will win either. But... I mean, if I had to pick one that I'd say I'd have more chance of winning, I would probably go Champions League this year, man. And I think it comes down, I think it comes down to mentality as well. Like I, I do think our mentality is improved and things like that, but I think you need something extra in the Champions League because as great as Real Madrid were, last couple of times they won it. Like I'm sure there was a year they played Chelsea almost went out, PSG almost went out, uh, and there was somebody else in that. I think it might have even been City. They still claw it over. I don't know if we've quite got that. And I do think it comes down to the depth now. You know, we've all been through this where it comes to injury. We say the same things about Thomas Partey. But I genuinely think for us to get through to the latter stages, you need to have t the Tommy Asus, the, the Partey's. Obviously, Timber's got a massive injury, but he would be another, you know, another positive. I think we need the squad. I feel there's certain frailties in us that that's an issue. So what? If we don't win a trophy, where are you at with that then? And Mikel Arteta and whatnot? Justification, bruv, as to why we haven't won it. Context as to why we haven't won it is key. Um, I know a lot of people that I do share content with, Northside. Uh, I know Lee Gunner, I know Kenny Kerr, I know Jez. A few of them have said, I want him gone if we don't win anything. Um, that's calm. Like That's their that's their opinion. I disagree with that slightly because I feel like there has to be a reason as to why you don't win something. So look, we've just sat here and spoken about how, one, we don't expect to win it, and two, how difficult it is to win it, right? So mm. when somebody doesn't win something that's difficult to do, I don't feel you can just say, right, off you go then. Let's get someone in. Now, don't get it twisted, DG. If we lose to Porto and we come fourth behind Ange, then there might be a consideration to say... Serious question marks. Maybe there's question marks for you to have to get the hell out of here now because this is a disgrace how to end this way. But if we miss out on the Champions League final on penalties to Real Madrid and we take Man City to the last game of the season and they pip us on goal difference, I think that's incredibly harsh to sack Mikel Arteta then <laughs> because what he's done is put us into a Champions League final when we've been dreaming distance of potentially winning the two hardest trophies to win in football. I can't sack him on that on that respect. And this is coming from me, who's had my doubts. I still have to. I still have my doubts. Until he can prove to me that he can get us across the line, I'm going to have to have a little bit of concern to say, can this guy do it? Can he? Maybe. I, I hope so. But can he do it? And I don't think that's harsh. I don't think that's negative. I think that's just looking at football. And I did the same with Brendan Rodgers at Liverpool. Can he get him across the line? Unbelievable job to get him competing. Can he get him across the line? The answer was no. He had to go do it at Celtic and Leicester. So... We're going to get to a stage where we know exactly what we need about Mikel Arteta. And when the season ends, we're going to know exactly what we need to know about the Cronkies because they're either going to back him and go, do you know what? Fair play to you, man. You're so close. Get the players you need in the summer and go again. Or they're going to go, do you know what? You ain't really done it, but we're going to give you another 250 million anyway and just go crack on again. And that they're two very different things for me. You know, one is we've got the ambition to go and get you do it. We believe you're the man. You're only a few players away. Or you come fourth, but it don't really matter. Here's another 250 million. Go and buy a striker. We'll give it another go. I don't think football works like that, man. There's got to be accountability. There's got to be standards that are raised to a certain a certain level. 
Facts. And I, I believe personally, if we finish trophyless, there's going to have to be a massive justification and context as to why we should keep hold of Mikel Arteta if you believe he is the right guy to go win something next season. And it's got to be one of the majors next year because if he does stay, DG, right? And people are like, no, I'll keep him. If he comes, let's say we come third and let's say we, we go out to Porto, right? Poor season. People really want him to stay. And I still think he will stay, even if that happens, by the way. Um, there needs to be, seriously, where are we going next year then? Like, what does he have to do? Or does he just stay here for another 10 years and just enjoy life? Like, where are we trying to get to? So there has to be that. I think we have to be careful to go, wow, wow, wow. Oh, just keep going. It doesn't matter that we come fifth now. Oh, it doesn't matter we've gone bump back down to fourth. Hang on a minute. We're supposed to be, this is Arsenal, man. This isn't an experiment. Like, we're supposed to be competing with the best. Right now, he's got us into a position where we can now compete with the best. Now, what do we do? The next step's to go and win something, man. And that's where I'm at with Mikel. And that's for me as well. Like you've said a lot of things that I, I echo. I think the key thing is, is is context. You know, they do say in life or in football, the winners win, the loser explains. Obviously, if we don't win a major trophy, we're going to need context and to explain. I think the conversation has shifted away now for me personally with Mikel Arteta is actually what you said there in can you get us to the latter stages slash win the champs, win the Prem? Can you arrest your own frailties in your lineup or naiveties in your players and fully maximise all the variables that you can maximise and really go for it? Because we spoke on your channel, obviously on the face of it, losing to City last season in the Premier League. They, 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 Pep Guardiola, great players, treble, all of that stuff. It is what it is. But I believe in Arsenal fans' hearts or in the players' hearts, the variables that they could control. And I'm not asking them to win every game, but seeing out leads, arresting form early, not crying about VAR, but getting jobs done, like kind of what we did this year. These are things we failed to do. So I think the conversation has shifted away from the rebuild. Mikel Arteta, you've done bloody fantastic. There's 11 players generally we all like. You know, Arsenal fans will fight who's their favourites. We can see the tactics. You know, we've, in my opinion, we've married kind of sexy Arteta football with just being ugly and direct and exploiting set pieces obviously we still don't really have the depth and when Arteta comes out and says things like we we need to be a team that can score 100 goals or we got the finished squad I do look at him and say these points for me they're valid but I think they need to become redundant because it's not like you've just taken the job now you've been here for a while um, and I agree with you I, I agree with it's a case of ambition on, K, on, on KSE and I even question my, my own thoughts on that bro because it's like whether I believe in the Cronkies or not, you look at what, and I'm by no means an expert and, 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 and them things, but when you look at what they've done, you know, they get a manager that they believe in, they give you what they need to do, they put other people in place and they kind of leave you to your own devices. That's why I believe any successes or failures of these last two years in particular in the transfer market, etc., is on Edu and Mikel Arteta. And then mm -hmm. I wonder, are they as ambitious as fans? Obviously fans, we would, you know, if fans ran a football club, it'd be crazy, in it? But I feel, I, I feel, are they going to go, you know what, we're onto something. Something. Liverpool are going to do a rebuild. City, there's got to be a one year like when Liverpool won it that they can't get it done. Are we going to get over the line or are we going to say, you know what, we've got a young squad. Arteta respectfully is a novice. We're doing all right. We've been the, anything from first to third best team in the last two seasons. Let's see what next season has. And I do think next season the gloves need to be off. I think the gloves should be off this year. And I've told fans the gloves kind of will be off this year, um, which I believe they have. And I just feel last season was the best and worst thing for what could have happened to our football club. And I'm not saying I didn't want to be in a title challenge and whatnot. I just think it's fans of their their imagination has been a bit aroused. They've been a bit impatient and hungry. And I'm not saying be patient for the sake of being patient, but I, think, I said it last year and I'll say it again. I think last year kind of made fans believe that we're a level we're not. We're a very good football team. We're a very good competitive team. We're doing some great stuff. But as you know yourself, if we're looking at winning a Premier League title or winning the Champs, then a lot of things that I praise us with in line of the rebuild, they become redundant. You know, good teams get an X amount of clean sheets, get jobs done. You know, they arrest, like what you said, they arrest form early. Like, you know, you look at the Liverpool game in the FA Cup or the, you know, what, Aston Villa, Newcastle and West Ham. There hasn't been too many times we've been outplayed this season, but fundamentally... Mm -hmm. We haven't got the results. And if we're talking about winning a league, it's not about being good, bad or whatever. It's points on the board in May. How much games did you win, lose and draw? So I do believe that. And at the end of the day, Mikel Arteta has spent money. Like, you know, in the last two years, the signings have been great. Jesus has given something. Zinchenko's given something. Plenty of them. But then I have to focus on, he's done well, but the Kirios, the Fabio Vieiras, the Lacongas, the Tavares, is the inability to sell certain players, spelling, spending money on Kai Havertz, who even against West Ham, he was good. But then you look at the two people he was in midfield with, or the three-man trio, Declan Rice, another level. Odegaard, another level. Havertz, good. Does he bring, is he a difference? And then I believe a lot of these variables are on Mikel Arteta. And I agree with you in that people need to approach it with balance. It's like, for me, I feel 
there's too many people that are negative about context with Mikel Arteta. And then I think there's positive toxicness. Like you're just, he could blink and nobody's ever blinked like him. Nobody's ever done it like him. If he <laughs> is this good, bro, if he's, for me anyways, I rate Arteta. I think you're mad. You're in a nice way. You're a crazy genius. You do crazy things. I've not always agreed with a lot of your decisions, but the majority of them in hindsight, I've understood it. You, you've you got a lot of potential. But if I rate you like this and I'm saying this, that and the third, then when things go south or we don't achieve certain things, I have to ask questions of such, or I just think it's an idiot thing. I rate Saka. So if Saka doesn't score chances, he should be scoring. I'm looking at him very funny. If I didn't rate Saka and I thought, respectfully, I like Nelson, but if it's a Reese Nelson thing, I'm not really going to get at Nelson because I don't think his level's really and truly with that. So it's an interesting one, man. And, and the thing is, what I would say with the Cronkies, if we were like, and I don't want to call us that, but if we was a Chelsea under Jose Mourinho or no, Robin Abramovich, sorry, and you know, Arteta's got us to a point, but we've got to be ruthless. Who would be the succession planning? Are you going to go and get, for argument's sake, Jabby Alonso, who kind of loosely, you know, aligns to what we're trying to do on the project? I'm not really sure. I want to go back to Declan Rice quickly, bro. Do you think he's becoming a more complete midfielder if he isn't already? Because as you said, he, he was doing it at West Ham, but he's taking set pieces. You know, he's obviously scored a banger against West Ham, a last minute winner against Man United. Obviously, you know, uh, he, he scored against Chelsea as well. He's made a number of uh, clearances off the line. There's not too much he can't do, really. So where are you at with Declan Rice, man? And do you think he's underrated? Uh, if I'm honest with you, bro, I don't think that he's doing an amazing amount different to what he's done at West Ham. I just think he's surrounded by better players and in a better team. However, what yeah. I have seen from it, and I've, I've not, if I'm honest with you, I didn't watch him every week at West Ham. But what, no I, what, I, he, what I hear, the West Ham fans were like, he is unreal, mate. And then They, they were saying this. They the were. Top. They were saying this, man. So, um, however, he's definitely become more consistent as a footballer and become all round at Arsenal with some of the stuff that he's now doing. I never really saw him taking free kicks and set pieces like he's doing. Um, I definitely didn't see him um, putting out man of the match performances 90% of a season. I didn't see him with the... Um... <clears throat> Do you know what? This is probably the biggest compliment, the biggest two compliments I can give him. One, he doesn't look out of place in a better side. That's the biggest compliment Facts. I can give a footballer, really. Secondly, no one's talking about his price tag. Like, literally, again, no man. one. Facts. About it, man. Like, Facts. now, when Jack Greedish went to Man City, it was like, oh, that's a lot of money for him. What's he going to do? Now, people will look at his trophies that he's won and say it's been a great signing, but he was not pivotal to winning the treble. Man City would have won a treble without Jack Grealish, in my opinion. A lot of people might sit there and not want to hear that. Some Man City fans might say, no, that's harsh. Like, he was a massive part of it. Yeah, he contributed, but they all did. But if they wouldn't have had Jack Grealish, they would have brought somebody else in and they would have won it still, for me. If Declan Rice, if Arsenal win anything this season, we will look back and go, it's because of that signing. We won't go, oh, we would have signed it, won it even without him. Because we wouldn't have. He would have played in midfield. He would have been outstanding. So he was been outstanding. So um, last minute goals, driving us forward, playing in two positions, six or eight, leadership qualities on and off the pitch. Um, in terms of the interceptions and tackles, the stats are there to say that he's an outstanding footballer. Um, the way that he's fitted in and actually got along and, and kind of been looked up to in a first season at the age of 24. Yeah, this, this guy's incredible, man. This guy's incredible. I, I'm so, 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 so happy that we've got him. And everybody, ha, 105 million. Arsenal have had their pants pulled down. Yeah, man. I will, I'll take him ahead of Caicedo and Enzo. Any day I don't know week. who Caicedo is, man. I know I lost him <laughs> and play at Brighton. I couldn't be Same. playing for Chelsea. I haven't, I haven't seen him all season, man. From one Arsenal and England player to another, but Kyle Saka, like, do you think he's well class? Do you think he's disrespectful? But disrespected because. I, I, is Bukayo Saka the most entertaining winger I've ever seen or inside forward? 100% not. But I think there's a balance. You need to be effective. And I think at 22 years of age, for the amount of goals and, and differences his goals have provided and just carrying this team on his shoulders up until... He was even doing it last season, but at least in the last two years, we just mentioned Declan Rice, there's Martinelli, there's other players. Saka was doing it alone. Do you think he's disrespected? Like, Do you think he's world-class? Do you think he's disrespected? Do you think the goal posts always move when it comes to Bukayo? Uh, he's massively disrespected. I don't think he's world class yet. Neither do I. Um, everybody's different. Um, everybody has a different definition on world class, Perhaps. and um, I don't quite know what world class is, <laughs> if I'm honest, because no one can tell me. Everybody seems to think that well, world class is if they walk into a world eleven. No, it's not. No, it's just if they're the top three in their position. No, it's not. It's if they make any club better in the world. No, 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 it's not that. It's Everyone's if they got a different sort of remit for what it like, is. 
let's just stop with this, man. Like, is Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo world class? Yeah. No, they're not. They're elite. They're best in the world. They're up here. Then it drops down to this. Let's just stop all this nonsense, man. I don't care whether you think Saka's world class or not. Yet. Amen. All I know is that he's an unbelievable footballer and he will do very, very well in his career for club and country. There's no doubt about that. He already if is. you do it on the world stage, I think people can probably say that you're world class, right? If you do it for club and country and you score in World Cup finals like Mbappe does and you get to a stage where you win trophies for your club and you're pivotal to it, then I think you could say that you're potentially world class. Saka hasn't done that yet, but at 22, I wouldn't expect him to, right? Exactly. So I think people forget that a 22-year-old has got 100, 100 goals and assists in the youngest of the club's history. That is incredible. It's ridiculous. And this season, he's got 10 goals and seven assists, Deluded. That's not too bad, bro. I mean, I've not and been... people said he's having a bad season up. and other people getting praised to high heavens. That just tells me he's dying by the high standards he set. Bro, listen, there's been better players than him this season. But when people are bigging up Zobo Sly and they're not bigging up Saka, I can't, I can't listen to that. I can't listen to that, man. Facts. Like, for me. Um, and I like Zobo Sly, by the way. But I look at the situation of Saka this season and there's been games where I've gone, you're off it, bro. You've been poor. But that doesn't mean he's had a horrendous season and get him out. And oh my God, he needs a week like, to rest. He's had some rest. Yeah, he's had Dubai. He's come back stronger. He's going to get more of a break soon because we're out of the cup competitions. He's going to use that rest. Let's just let see let the season play out for Bukayo Saka. He's hit double digits again for the third season running. He's exactly. carried this team for four years. 22. And I'm... Unfortunately, bro, there's a lot of people that do not like English players that are English, by the way. I just want to say that they can't say they're wrong about Bakayo Saka as well. Yeah, and and this is the problem. And I don't know why that is. I feel like Martinelli's disrespected as well. But I do feel like Saka uh, is the one that is English. Oh, is he really that good? Is he that great? Is he one flash in the pan? Is he really going to make it? Is it just because Arsenal ain't that great and he looks good in a poor side? All this crap I'm hearing. Ah, oh, man, he's my favourite player. He definitely will be an unbelievable player when you look back at Premier League history. He will be one of the best players when he's when he when he retires. He will be one of the best players in Premier League history for me. Already, you can see it, and that's if he stays in the Premier League. I hopefully will at Arsenal. I think when his career finishes, you will look back and you will go, "Yeah, Salah." Yeah, Ronaldo. Yeah, Beckham. Yeah, Saka. That's what you'll do in that right wing position. I honestly believe that. Like, there's nothing in his game that I look at and go, "Yeah, I need to. I need to see." That's just dog shit. Like the rest of it's fine, but that's dog shit. He's good at everything. Now, yes, he can improve in finishing. Yes, he can improve some of his uh, range of um of variety. Yeah, he can sometimes improve uh, some of his strength at times. Even though I believe he's strong. Um. But he's not bad at any of those things. Facts. He's got technical ability. He can shoot. He can score. He can pass. He can score from long range. He can interlink. He can one-two. He's got a good footballing brain. He's got a great mentality. He comes off the pitch at West Ham. They're going to him, oh, you played well. You got man of the match. He's like, oh, I don't know how. I missed a few chances. It's poor. Yeah, Elite Italian mentality. Monster. Wants to get more more better. And I love it, man. I think, I think he's top, man. Think Bro, he's, he's a key player for club and country. He's one of the best in his position. He's a difference maker. He deals with the world on his shoulders for Arsenal and everything. All the curveballs that were thrown at him, missing a penalty in the title race against West Ham. Obviously, bottling it with England and well as well. He gets some with it. It just feels like the goalposts move. First, it's, ah, oh, he's a one-trick pony. Then he's not entertaining and things. Well, how many wingers are very good to watch in today's day and age? They could do a million skills, but they're not putting up the numbers. I don't want it to come to numbers. But being a winger in today's day and age, you need to get that, especially in an Arsenal system where let's have it right. If Saka isn't bagging, we, they're, they're, we're not winning games per se like that. As much as we talk about sharing out goals and whatnot, Saka is the only one in the last two, three years that we could say is a proven, tested goal scorer in an Arsenal shirt. Odegaard showed it last year. All the others kind of showed it. So we'll just have to keep going. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy for it. The goalposts move. I'm by no stretch of the imagination comparing Bakayo Saka to, you know, what Salah's done at Liverpool, Messi and things. But the goalposts, for people that were better than Saka, the goalposts shifted 10 times. You know, everyone can see Messi's the best, but there was used to be, oh, he ain't won a World Cup. He can't do it against English sides. And you saw what what the fe- what the happened in the future. So it is well, it is, man. Just keep doing what you're doing. What do you make of the Mbappe rumours, man? I've got two last questions for you. What do you make of the Mbappe rumours? Like, I love, I love it. it? I, I love it because we're now being actually involved in the conversation with players of this level. And that's always what I've wanted. I've always wanted when, whether your name's Lionel Messi, Cristiano Ronaldo, or whether your name's Mbappe or Haaland, with the, with the words Arsenal were interested, that's all I want. 
It doesn't mean Arsenal are going to sign them. It doesn't mean that um, these players are going to go, yeah, I'm coming to Arsenal. But it means that we're at least considered. And years and years, we were like, oh, we ain't going to afford them. We'll go get Mustafi instead. You know, we're going to get Van Dijk. We'll go get come Emirates from Bayern Munich level. Yeah, bro, these kind of clubs. Exactly this. So I look at it right now. Kylian Mbappe is going to go to Real Madrid. That that that's that's just facts for me. I can't see him going anywhere else. But the fact that he's actually had the discussion to say he doesn't mind following the footsteps of Thierry Henry and the Arsenal have flattered him in the past when we were linked with him. That to me excites me because it means that even if he doesn't come, teams are now looking at Arsenal as actually it's not a bad move. And that's what I'm at. When you're, you know, he looks, let's just, let's just, right, let's keep it real. He's leaving PSG. These are his options. He can go to a Man City. He can go to a Real Madrid. He can go to an Arsenal, maybe even a Liverpool. What are the the pools for him? Well, trophies at Man City and Real Madrid's one. Real Madrid's heritage is the other because Real Madrid are the biggest club ever in the world in history. So that's them. Man City are going to be guaranteed trophies. The other two options, let's just say it's Liverpool and Arsenal. Um, a little bit different because you don't quite know what you're going to get. But if it is, I don't want to go Man City or Real Madrid. I want to come to England and I want to be the star. I don't want it to be Haaland. I want it to be me. So he chooses Liverpool or Arsenal. Now, the benefits at the moment of coming to Arsenal is that Liverpool, we don't know what they're going to be next season away from Klopp. We don't know who their manager is going to be. We don't know how long it's going to take for them to change. Salah's probably going to go. Van Dijk's probably going to be not going to be around for long. It could be a very different Liverpool. Arsenal, he knows what he's getting. He knows that he's getting into the first team. He knows that he's going to be their number 14 and their Thierry Henry. Eddie, you're he going knows to he's going to be off. the first boy of everything. He knows that he's going to be surrounded by players that are very, very similar age to him, that, that can grow together with him. I think it would make sense if he wanted to come to England. Then there's the wage situation. And also the London aspect be, as well. And London is always a pool, yeah. Then there's the wages. Um he ain't going to be on 1.3 million a week in the England, mate. That's just not going to happen. It's like when Benzema was linked and everyone went, well, who's going to pay him 100? Well, no one is. He's going to have to take a pay cut. Exactly the same with Mbappe, right? Um, he's still going to want Real Madrid, apparently. Exactly, even at Real Madrid. So he's still going to want between 400 and 600k a week, probably somewhere in England and Spain, right? But that's what you're going to have to look at. Now, if we do want to do that, we're going to have to somehow make it work. But financially, the structure has to be so it doesn't put us in the absolute mud. But what you have to also do is if Mbappe, and there's a chance to get him, you go do Move it. Move heaven and earth, man. You go do it. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, I don't think he's going to Arsenal. I really don't. And I don't want right. people to think that why I'm saying this is, oh, my God, he's going to come to Arsenal. Dan's deluded. He thinks he's going to be Arsenal. No, um, I don't. I think he's going to Real Madrid. But my point to this is if it's Mbappe or if it's the next Cristiano Ronaldo, and they're considering Arsenal and that person's name being in the same bracket, even if it's a rumour, means we're doing something right again, man. You're bang on the money. I mean, I'd love Mbappe, you know. Obviously, the way he kind of acts like a bit of a spoiled child would put people off. But if there was anyone that could fix that, be Arteta. I did, the man spoken today about that. If there, I don't actually agree with ruining our wage structure, and obviously that have a knock-on effect. But if there was players to do it for... He's one of the players that are an exception to the rule and get it done. My last question for you, because I know you need to keep it moving. Obviously, Raya seems to have found his feet. Where are you at with Raya and where are you at with the Raya Ramsdale stuff now? Uh, well, first of all, I was really, really, really impressed with Raya. Uh, the last two games, but probably in the last four, he's definitely picked up. Since Dubai again, I've really been impressed with him. I always felt like he'd be number one when he came to the club because I just didn't see why he would sign somebody like that if they weren't in their plans to be number one. And I didn't like the way it was handled. I never really got the hump that it was number one. It was how it was handled for me and the way that Mikel Arteta did it, I thought was very novice to be fair and really out of order on Aaron Ramsdale, right? Just to bin somebody overnight and never really see him again is poor. He's played his last game for Arsenal. We won't see him again. Um, the yeah. only way we'll see Aaron Ramsdale is if we win the league by nine points and he comes and yeah. plays in his last game. We'll see him against Brentford at the end, and that's about it. Oh, that's right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. We will. We'll see him. We have well done. We will and see that's him. That's his one. last one. That'll be his last one. Sorry. That will be his last one. Um, well done. Yeah. Um, against Brentford at home. So that will be his last game. Um, listen, I've got no problem with David Rea. I've been really impressed with the fact that he has looked commanding at crosses. I think he's definitely improved of his feet. And I know people said, well, that was what we bought him for, but it weren't looking great looks at times. Like confident with that now. Exactly. Looks a lot more confident. But actually, the thing that's really impressing me with Raya, bro, is 
he's actually kept things moving really quick and his quick thinking and his throw outs or his kicks quick thinking have actually right. allowed to either get some goals from it or there's been some creativity made from it. And I think this quick thinking has allowed us to, to get into those positions. So I think he deserves his flowers. I do feel a bit sorry for the lad. He's come to Arsenal when nobody really wanted him. The fans made it quite clear that Aaron Ramsdale was their favourite. That wasn't really fair on him. His confidence was knocked and I can kind of understand why it would be. But one thing I will big Arteta up for is that actually he's taken a real poor decision um, in some people's minds, stuck with it and he's made it work. And it's now Another unpopular decision like from him that's kind very, of... Very, very, very ballsy, ballsy decision to make. And it's working for him right now and we've just got to be happy and hope it continues. I don't want to see the David Rea that I saw at the start of the season, but he's looking to be very comfortable now. And um, yeah, it's... Um, statistically looking well and with my eyes now it's starting to look well as well so yeah man hope it continues bro I'm with you with that man Ramsdale I'm sorry it had to be you but at the same time I support Arsenal Football Club Raya is doing everything I still am yet to see that amazing game from Raya like a Ramsdale against it at Anfield but I'm sure that will happen and Raya just looks a lot more confident it's confidence to me it looks like the buyers worked wonders and everything's ticking over man Dan let people know where they can find you before I let you get out of here I can't imagine they don't know but yeah man Big up, man. Listen, always a pleasure coming on with you. Thanks for having me on, that. mate. And uh, yeah, it's Dan Arsenal 87. And if you do want to come follow my YouTube channel, then it's Football's 12th Man Podcast. Uh, and uh, yeah, I do loads of content throughout the night. So um, please come and join. I think we've just hit 16K. So if you can get us towards 20, that'd be amazing. No, like Dan said, man, get him to 20. I can't lie. I'm not just saying this because he's my guy, but he makes very good content. I think he provides a lot of balance. I think yeah, even man. when he's quite frankly peed off, he does a good way of conveying his opinion and being fair and crit critiquing and praising where fair. So, yeah, all you need to do is hit the hit, hit his link to his YouTube channel in the title and go and have a butcher's people. And hopefully the next time we speak, one consistency remains in that we're still winning games, man. But yeah, let us know in the comments what your thoughts are. Make sure you're liking and subscribing. Dan's got something to do, so let's let him get out of here. And yeah, peace, people. I'll be back at 3.45. But for now, safe. Dan, one love, my guy. Safe. Love, man. Peace. Oh, yeah. I've been giving, like...